James Cameron wrote the basic outline for the abyss when he was in high school, attending a lecture about deep sea diving and liquid breathing. Years later, he would get nearly $70 million to make it into a movie. Cameron, being a fan of deep sea diving himself and breaking the record for solo dives back in 2012, has quite a bit of experience in the water. Even so, he nearly drowned while filming this movie, and several other actors have come forward saying that production was one of the worst experiences of their entire acting career. So, let's watch The Abyss and see if all their trouble was worth it. It opens up on a Navy submarine carrying a bunch of nukes. They say later on that they basically have five times Hiroshima on board, so it's pretty important that this sub doesn't get attacked. And that's exactly what happens. But who's the attacker? Who, or should I say whatever it is, is coming in fast, 130 knots, and it passes right over the sub. The resulting turbulence is so strong that it pushes them into the cliffside, and water comes rushing into the sub, sinking it into the abyss. Having lost contact with such an important vessel, the Navy needs to act immediately. To make matters worse, a hurricane's coming in. They don't have time to send in their own fleet to recover the warheads. So they have to enlist the help of the crew of a nearby oil rig, led by Bud Brigham. Why would these blue collar workers agree to help out? Well, in a word, money. They're offered three times pay as a bonus if they do the job. Obviously, they're pretty happy with that idea. Coming on board to assist them is Lieutenant Coffey and his crew of Navy SEALs. Really also joining them is Lindsey Brigman, hey. Bud's soon-to-be ex-wife, and the engineer who designed this underwater rig. Once they're reunited, they start bickering right away. Remind me again why these two got married? We were due to go back out on the same ship, six months of tests. If you were married, you got a stateroom, otherwise it was bunks. Okay, good reason. Will you come over oh, time well, I guess that makes sense. Upset, Bud rips off his wedding ring and throws it into the toilet, which he later fishes out. I only bring up this part because for the rest of the movie, his hand is blue. With everyone on board, we're introduced to this cool little gimmick that, aside from the creatures, is the most memorable thing about this movie. It's what they call a fluid breathing system, or basically breathable water. Now, it's not like it allows you to just breathe in regular ocean water, but once it fills your lungs and you get used to it, it does allow you to go to depths that humans just normally couldn't reach due to pressure. It turns out that this stuff really is a thing. And when they demonstrate it using a rat, it's the real deal. A rat was really held underwater and forced to breathe in this liquid. Kind of mean, but also kind of cool at the same time. Finally, the divers all go down to explore the wrecked sub. It turns out that it didn't fall all the way down to the ocean floor, but it's stuck on a shelf, so that's good. As they get closer, we can really appreciate the size of this thing. It's huge! When they go inside, the movie sort of makes a dramatic shift from adventure science fiction to horror real quick. Not only is there a bunch of bodies floating around, but in general just a bunch of debris and paperwork, it's creepy for sure. To cover more ground, they decide to split up. Bud and his crew go one way, while Coffee and his team go the other. Coffee gets into a lockbox and finds a binder labeled Crypto. Huh, must be where he kept his password for his Bitcoin wallet. Hold on to that, buddy. It's going to be worth something in a few decades. Bud continues looking around the sub with Jammer, who starts to freak out a bit. The whole site is just too much for him to handle, so Bud tells him to hang back while he goes ahead. 
but being separated only makes things worse. And then, something floats up to Jammer. We can see in his mask that it looks like some sort of bioluminescent fish or something like that. When the guys get back to Jammer, they see that he's messed up and that his oxygen is too high. They manage to fix it, but now, for most of the movie, Jammer's going to be knocked out and in a coma. While the guys are in there, Lindsay's outside in a mini-sub, and she gets a visit from the creature Jammer saw, which at this point just looks like a blob of light. Back on board the main underwater rig, they develop some of the film Lindsay took, but as you would expect this early on in the movie, she didn't get anything. So they blame it on the Russians, no, thinking that they have We're some sort of experimental light ship. And if they get their hands on the warheads on board the submarine, that's bad news for everyone. Topside, it doesn't take long for this news to spread, and soon enough, we're on the verge of an all-out war. Hearing this, Coffee knows that they have to put a stop to it, so they steal a mini-sub and head down to retrieve a warhead. The plan is to bring it back to the rig, arm it, and then put it back in the submarine to blow up all the nukes. That way no one can have it. But don't you think that that might bother some of the locals down there? Mainly the alien sea creatures. Topside, the hurricane is hitting full force and tossing the ship all around. This girl nicknamed One Night, I'm not going to ask how she got that nickname, goes to remove the cable which attaches them to the main rig. But it's moving around too much and she just can't get it. Suddenly the crane holding all of this up is destroyed and falls down into the depths. It's heading right for them. All they can do is prepare for impact. Luckily, when it lands, it falls right in front of them. No damage. So that's the good news. As for the bad news, well, the crane keeps falling over the edge. And with the tether still attached, they all go over. The crews tossed and turned a bit as they fight to save as much as they can. In the end, a few people die, but thank goodness the rat's safe. Bud almost doesn't make it, with the door closing in on him, but his ring stops it. Good thing he didn't flush it down the toilet. When it's all said and done, they're able to block off the flooded parts of the ship, and they're safe for now. Lindsay goes out to hook up more oxygen for them to breathe, and gets another look at the underwater creature. This time, we get a much better look at it, and now we can see that at least its ship looks like a light-up stingray. Lindsay manages to snap a picture of it, and then it just zooms off. She goes back onto the ship and shows the photograph to the rest of the crew. For some reason, she gets the feeling that these things are intelligent, from another world, and they don't mean us any harm. Yeah? Well, tell that to the nuclear sub they sunk earlier. Tensions between the two groups grow as Bud's crew sees what the SEALs have brought on board. A nuke on the ship is the last thing they need. Bringman calms everyone down, but they saw coffee, and more specifically his hands. They were shaking, the first signs of high-pressure nervous syndrome. While everyone gets some much-needed sleep, something comes in through the moon pool and finds Lindsay first. She wakes everyone up, and they all get a good look at it. To me, it looks like Morpha, the boss from the Water Temple in Zelda. But in the abyss, it's just seawater, not an alien life form. Here we learn that the alien creatures can control water to make it do whatever they want. On a planet that's 71% water, hey, that's pretty handy. Just as they're starting to get somewhere and maybe make contact, Coffee cuts the thing in half. But now they have proof that this isn't Russia, so they can put this whole nuke thing behind them, right? Well, no. Coffee has gone full on crazy, and to him, this doesn't change anything. He still wants to get the warhead down there, so he starts the timer for three hours loads it up in a rover, and gets ready to head out. At this point, even the SEALs are starting to doubt Coffee's leadership. Three hours just isn't enough time to get them all to safety, 
So blowing up the bomb will basically kill all of them too. Bud and this guy Catfish head out into the icy water to stop him. Bud eventually makes it to the moon pool and carefully sneaks up on Coffee. He reaches for his gun, but he sees Bud and points it right at his face and pulls the trigger. Luckily, one of the seals removed the clip when he saw that crazy look in Coffee's eye. Good thing too, because now it's a fair fight. The guys brawl back and forth for a while until it looks like Coffee has the upper hand, which makes sense because he's a trained killer. But then, Catfish comes in to save the day. With it two against one, Coffee bails and heads out in the mini sub. Bud suits up to go after him and just barely manages to catch a ride. He works on getting the warhead free, but he can't, so he ties a rope to it. And that's when Coffee notices him, and he goes on the attack. Just as it looks like he's got him, Lindsay comes in to save the day. The two mini subs fight it out in an underwater battle. While they fight, the rope comes loose, and the warhead falls down to the bottom of the ocean. Eventually, Lindsay outmaneuvers Coffee, and he falls off the cliff into the abyss. The deeper he goes, the higher the pressure. And it's not long before the ship implodes, like a tin can. But the two lovebirds aren't out of the water just yet. Literally, water's filling up their mini-sub, and there's nothing they can do to stop it. Lindsay knows that the only way that this can go is that she basically has to die. But hopefully, the icy cold water will constrict her blood vessels enough so that they can bring her back later. But that's a pretty big hopefully. After she basically drowns in Bud's arms, he swims as fast as he can back to the rig, where the rest of the crew is waiting for him. They do everything they can to try to bring her back, but it's just been too long, and everyone but Bud gives up on her. He just won't stop trying. And good thing too, because after all hope is lost, Lindsay breathes again. You can do it, baby. <laughs> but they still have that nuke to deal with, and Bud volunteers to go down and disarm it. Because of the extreme pressure, he's going to have to breathe in some of that oxygen water, which takes a little bit of time to get used to. And now he can't talk, because, well, he's basically breathing water. So he uses a little keyboard to communicate with everyone. Once in the water, he grabs onto one of the rovers to dive down deeper and deeper until the pressure destroys it too. So now it's just the weights on his suit pulling him down. Around 12,000 feet, he starts to lose it, typing gibberish. So Lindsay gets on the comms and has to get all deep with him to keep his mind off of things for a bit. Eventually, he makes it to the warhead just fine, and he sees that he's not alone down here. The place is all lit up from the aliens. But that doesn't distract him from the job he has at hand, to disarm the nuke. He's told to cut the blue wire with a white stripe, but the glow stick he's using makes it look like both the wires are the same color. Luckily, he snips the right one, and all is fine except that he's running out of oxygen. There isn't enough in the tank for him to make it back up, and it turns out that he knew that all along. This was always going to be a one-way trip. As he lays there dying, one of the creatures finds him and lends a helping hand. It carries Bud all the way back to the mothership. They put up a wall of oxygen so that he can breathe, and they start to communicate with him. They show him news from the surface, and he learns that a giant wave is approaching all continents at once, about to cover the entire Earth in water. Bud remembers that the aliens were able to control water before, so he knows that they're doing this. But why? Well, if it isn't obvious, it's because what we do to ourselves. Okay, that's enough, I get the point. The bombing and killing of other people for no reason other than power. 
It's the typical James Cameron preachy crap. Anyway, the wave is fast approaching, but then suddenly it just stops right there in midair. The aliens have seen Bud's last words to his wife, that disarming the nuke was a one-way ticket and that he loves her. This changed their minds and they see that there's still some good left in the world. The team gets communications back up with Topside and they start coming up with a plan to get them to the surface. But then suddenly, something huge is on their radar. Much to their surprise, the crew gets a message from Bud. They assumed he was long gone, but no, he's fine and he's bringing some friends with him. Just then, the mothership surfaces, picking up all the other boats, including their underwater rig with them. They all get out to see Bud, and they all live happily ever after. And that was The Abyss. James Cameron's go at an underwater creature feature. With a big budget, I expected some good quality here, and I have to say, I was pleasantly pleased. It did win the Oscar for Best Visual Effects in 1990. And watching the movie, yeah, every shot is a marvel to look at. Be it the dark blue turning black as you get deeper, to the alien creatures themselves. And that water tube looked pretty familiar, right? The same effect was used in Terminator 2 on the T-1000. But was the Abyss a flop? Was all their hard work and setbacks, like the crew nearly dying, worth it financially? Well, if you're only looking at the numbers, uh, yeah, kinda. The budget was $69.5 million. The movie grossed $89.8 million. So it did make money, but it's safe to say that the studio expected it to make more. At the same time, I wouldn't say The Abyss is James Cameron's worst movie. Remember, this guy made a movie about flying piranhas. I like the breathable liquid idea, and I think about that every time I dive into the deep end at the pool. The part where Lindsay just about dies is very emotional, and you might even tear up a bit. And then the alien creatures look cool too. At first you think, okay, maybe this is some sort of undiscovered bioluminescent stingray. But then you see their mothership and their ability to control water, and you know that these things aren't from this planet. They do their best to try to explain some of the more science fiction elements of the movie. Like at the end when they all pop back up on the surface, Lindsay said somehow the aliens made it so they didn't have to decompress. Then they just kind of left it at that. Some might say that that's lazy, but hey, at least they brought it up. The runtime is a bit long, with the special edition that I watched being almost three hours. That's a long time to sit through a movie, but it didn't feel like there was a lot of filler, and it was fun. Even so, it's not a movie that I think I'll be watching again. One and done, and then move on. I give The Abyss three and a half oxygenated waters out of four. Bud, you know your hand is blue. 